Theatre of Science, welcome to our second lesson on oceans. Today we are looking at coral reefs. Previous lesson we looked at ocean zones, but you don't need to have watched that lesson to enjoy this lesson. Um, coral reefs, let's go. What are coral reefs? Well, actually, um, these enormous, beautiful structures that we call coral reefs, they're teeny tiny little individual animals. They're animals, they're not plants. Tiny little animals called polyps, which is my new favourite word. And uh, the polyps uh, use particles in the seawater to build these hard skeletons and then they attach themselves to rocks or to the dead skeletons of other polyps. And loads and loads of them uh, gather together and they're, they're actually nocturnal. So the little polyps, they stay inside their little skeletons during the day and then at night uh, they come out to feed. So I want us to do our activity. You've got uh, any kind of bottle, white vinegar or any kind of vinegar, balloons and eggshells. We need to get all that stuff together really fast so that we can watch it happening throughout the course of the lesson. But before we do our activity, I just want to show you how these little polyps make their skeletons. You know what it is? It's chemistry. Here's a polyp and this is its skeleton and we are going to look at how it makes this skeleton, the chemistry behind it. So, uh, one carbon particle and two oxygen particles all joined together make something that you might have heard of called carbon dioxide. And that's a gas which is floating in the air. And two hydrogen particles and one oxygen particle joined together make another thing you've definitely heard of called water. Or you could call it H2O. And you could call this CO2. And what happens is carbon dioxide dissolves into the seawater and it makes something called carbolic acid. And yes, you've guessed it, carbolic acid has two hydrogen particles, one carbon particle and three oxygen particles. And that very quickly breaks down. So the hydrogen particles go somewhere else. And we're left with carbon eight. And what the polyp does is it takes calcium, which is another particle that's floating around in the seawater, and it joins it to the carbonate to make something called calcium carbonate. Yeah, it's not rocket science. And calcium carbonate is what the uh, polyp's skeleton is made of. Now, does anyone know anything like a household object that is made of calcium carbonate? Eggshells, also made of calcium carbonate. So let's do an activity with our calcium carbonate, okay? See what happens. So come down here with me. Chalk, yes, nice one, Sarah Alda, because what is chalk? Chalk is just the skeletons of billions and billions and millions of teeny, teeny, tiny little sea creatures all lying down on top of each other. We did that in fossils, didn't we? Right, you got a bottle, uh, it could be a wine bottle, beer, this is vinegar, anything you like. Uh, as long as you can fit a balloon over the top of it. Get your eggshells and just squish them into the mouth of the bottle. You should probably have at least two eggshells for this, but obviously the more the merrier. <laughs> I'm making a right mess here. Um, so you can see why people often think that coral is a plant, can't you? Because it is like they've taken root. They don't move their whole lives. They just attach themselves to rock and stay there. So we're going to have a little look at the end of the lesson about um, like how they reproduce and how they like fight each other if they're just staying in the same place. Eleanor says that she is seven. Eleanor, is that a new thing? You just are seven. That's good. Seven's a very good age to be watching my lesson, I think. Right, so I've got all my eggshells crushed up in my bottle. Give it a little shake, but they don't need to be really crushed up because they're very thin anyway, so they've got a big surface area. And then I'm going to add my vinegar and stick the balloon on top. There you go. <laughs> Leslie's 55 and she loves these shows. Thanks, Leslie. That's what it's all about, you see. A lot of people messaging me to say that, you know, they've had conversations while they were eating dinner about stuff they've learned in my lessons. That's what I want it to be about. Um, I'm probably using more than you have to here because, you know, I'm the teacher and it's got to be good. But I think really we can just cover the eggshells. Oh, I'm talking, I've got my balloon on the... Oh, quick, get it on, get it on. What is happening in here at the moment is what we call a chemical reaction. 
Um, one of the ways you can tell that there is a chemical reaction happening, if you're doing this at home, have a look at the eggshells and you might see some bubbles of gas coming off. That can be an indication. See that? And if I give it a bit of a shake, you should do that too. Give it a good shake. You might even be able to hear from where you are. It's making a hissing noise. So relaxing. Isaac, I do eat a lot of eggs. I do. Shall I show you what's happening with my little particles? An egg is calcium carbonate. And what happens is vinegar's got loads of different particles in it, but uh, it's got hydrogen particles, which, when you put them on the eggshell, react with the calcium carbonate. Now, the calcium stays in the eggshell and forms a new product, and the carbonate and the two hydrogen atoms, particles, form carbonic acid. Huh. And then, well, what happens then? A gas is given off. Can you see what gas might be given off using these particles? Oh, yeah, Eugenia is saying CO2. Isaac AJ has got it exactly. Carbon dioxide. What else is formed? Let's have a look. We'll take the carbon dioxide particles out because that's the gas, which is less dense than uh, the liquid. So it's just rising up. And what have we got left? Oh, look at that. H2O. Two H's and an O. It's water. Yeah, exactly, Izzy. Exactly. Well done, Megan. Yeah. Exactly the opposite of what's happening um, to these little polyps making their shelves. We'll have a look in a bit about how acidity of the oceans, uh, increasing acidity of the oceans is damaging coral. Why are corals important? To, uh, to humans, they're important practically because about 500 million people all across the planet uh, have jobs which are related to coral, either fishing or tourism, um, and they buffer shorelines from hurricanes. Obviously, that's important practically to humans. But if you've seen any documentaries or footage of coral reefs, you'll know that they also provide habitats for wildlife. So uh, little creatures live within their skeletons, and then because those little creatures are there, bigger creatures are attracted, which eat the little creatures. We're going to look at food chains next lesson. But a huge wealth from shrimps to sharks um, living in coral reefs. Coral reefs, they think, cover about, I think it's about 0.4% of the ocean, but 25% of marine creatures rely on coral reefs. Why is warm water hurting them? To find out about that, you need to know that coral is not just an animal. Coral is the most beautiful example of what we call a symbiotic relationship. So if you've heard the word symbiotic before, it might be, you might know that it's, it's where creatures or organisms live together. So the really obvious example is like big crocodiles with birds in their mouths. The crocodiles don't eat the birds because the birds are basically cleaning the crocodile's teeth, eating little bits of food stuck in the crocodile's teeth. So the birds get food from the crocodiles and the crocodiles get their teeth cleaned. So that's kind of a symbiotic relationship, but coral is, is sort of much more impressive, I think, because it's, it's like two different organisms uh, coming together to form what we call a stable unit. So coral is actually white. Um, the colour is caused by tiny little algae plant, which lives inside the coral, like sort of inside the coral's cells. The coral gives protection to the algae and the coral gets to eat some of the, the sugars and the food that the algae is making. It's actually very similar, I think, to one of my favourite things on this planet, which is lichen. It's a fungus and an algae. And yeah, it's very similar to coral. So fungus can't photosynthesise, they can't make food. So the algae, which can photosynthesise, produces sugars and the fungus consumes the sugar. But the fungus gives protection to the algae, like protects it from ultraviolet radiation. In this relationship, it's very much the fungus that is dominant. In fact, scientists use the word farming. Like we think basically the fungus might be farming the algae. How cool is that? I, I want you to never pass this stuff again without thinking about how amazing and beautiful it is and then thinking about coral. And in coral, um, it's, it's not a fungus and algae, it's an animal and algae. And the animal is similarly in control. When the sea gets too warm, the animal, the polyp 
the coral, can expel the algae from its cells, like just get rid of the algae. So it's the algae that create all these beautiful colours in the coral, and once they've gone, uh, the coral just looks white, and that is called coral bleaching. Now, coral bleaching does not mean that the coral is dead, but it is extremely vulnerable to dying. It kind of, like if it was a human, it would, it would have a weakened immune system, uh, and when it does die, it goes brown. Um, a good example of, of how dangerous coral bleaching can be, in 2016, the sea was quite warm anyway, and then a storm made uh, the water even warmer, and um, the coral reef in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, got bleached, and half of the coral in the Great Barrier Reef has died. How is ocean acidification hurting coral? Let's go back to our diagram. I told you that the hydrogen particles like go off somewhere. Um, if something becomes more acidic, then it gains hydrogen particles. Now, usually the ocean can cope with this because the ocean is massive, but um, with increased global warming, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're not going to go into it, but that is meaning that there, there's too many hydrogen particles. Um, it's important to note for chemistry, it doesn't mean that the ocean water is acidic, it's just a bit more acidic. And the ocean becoming more acidic means that the coral uh, doesn't have as many carbonate particles to work with, so it's unable to reinforce and build its skeleton, so the skeleton becomes quite brittle and is, it has that more danger of dying. How polyps reproduce, how coral reproduces is either the top of the polyp pops off the parent polyp and lands nearby and grows again, or three quarters of polyps give off male or female cells and they all mix together in the oceans and drift along and they have to produce loads and loads and loads and loads because the little tiny baby polyps which are called planulae are in danger of being eaten as they drift along so they, the polyp makes loads and loads and loads of them so that enough of them can land and build new skeletons and form hopefully new corals. Um, how do they fight? just before story time. This is brilliant. If you've watched the uh, Blue Planet episode of corals, you will see two corals getting too close to each other, two live corals, like as they grow, you know, it's getting a bit crowded. One of the polyps, the coral, just like reaches out its internal organs and puts them on the other one and just digests it. Like, I can't put you in my mouth because I can't move, so I will bring my stomach to you. And then it gets eroded and, and the other polyp wins. Story time. Are you sitting comfortably? Like, have you got cushions? Blankets? Yeah, you ready? Because I did too much reading again. <laughs> Captain James Hook. He was born in 1724. His dad was a farm worker, but James very quickly moved to... Whitby and joined the Navy and he studied maths, charting, geography, astronomy, he worked really hard and finally he was promoted and given his first voyage. The planet Venus was going to pass in front of the sun. Cook was put in command of a ship called, a very famous ship built in Whitby, called the Endeavour. And he was told to take some very important scientists to Tahiti to study this passing of Venus across the sun. Famous people on board included uh, Charles Green, famous astronomer, and the botanist, biologist, Joseph Banks. Um, but he also had a secret mission from the British government because Europeans at the time were obsessed with cataloguing and mapping and taking over the world. He was told to try and find the fabled continent of terror, Australia. Uh, spoiler, this continent does not exist. They set sail. They got to Tahiti and they saw the passing of Venus across the sun. And then they went further on uh, sailed to New Zealand and along Australia's east coast, which had never before been seen by Europeans. And Cook writes a 753-page-long diary 
of his fantastic adventure. It's in the National Library of Australia. They call it one of Australia's most significant historical documents. It gives a rare first-hand account of some of the earliest interactions between the First Nations people, that's the people who were living in Australia when James Cook got there, and uh, the Europeans when they landed in Australia. Now, the National Museum of Australia is putting together the First Nations people's side of the story. Um, until now, we tend to just read the diaries of the Europeans, but the Aboriginal people who live uh, in this part of Australia right now, they are the direct descendants of the people who saw Cook when he arrived. Um, and they didn't tend to write their history down, but their spoken version is, uh, is getting recorded. It's been passed down through the generations and uh, we're finally hearing it. So I'm going to try and tell you a bit of that too. When the Endeavour reached Australia, Cook notes in his diary that they see columns of smoke. Now on the shore, what was happening was that people had never seen anything as big and white in the sea as the sail of the ship. And they assumed that it was a huge pelican. Now the pelican was known to be a very greedy bird which would steal your fish when you were out fishing. So the locals kept an eye on the boat and they sent smoke signals up along the beach saying, hey, look out to sea everyone, look out to sea. What is that enormous pelican? Now the first part of Australia that Captain Cook passed in the Endeavour um, was a very sacred mountain. Um, the locals say that from every direction it looks like a woman lying down and its real name means Mother Mountain but Cook called it uh, Mount Dromedary. Dromedary means camel. It was a great insult. At 60 years after this, in this exact bit of Australia, Cook's visit would directly lead to more Europeans actually pushing the locals out of this area and making them live in reserves where speaking their own language was banned and children could be removed from their families. So some people think of Cook's arrival in Australia as a very exciting event and some people see it as the start of this horrendous treatment. The land was given back to the local people in 2006. Cook sailed on. He didn't land there. He sailed on until finally he saw a place where he could stop and reach shore. Um, these people on this part of Australia saw the ship and uh, thought it was clouds at first. And then it got closer and they thought it was an island. And then it got even closer and the boats started rowing towards the shore and they were pretty certain then that the people must be ghosts because they'd never seen people so pale. Uh, they threw seeds which landed at the feet of Cook and his men. Now their ancestors living in Australia now, they say uh, that these locals weren't trying to kill the men. They say if they'd wanted to spear them, they would have done. So they, they threw spears at their feet to warn the ghosts away. Um, but Cook, guess what he did? He gets out his gun and he shoots and he injures someone. He sees blood. Um, a shield with a bullet hole in it can actually still be seen in the British Museum. And then they do come ashore. Um, now for eight days, the Europeans try and talk to and trade with the locals, but they don't seem very interested. Joseph Banks, a botanist, says, these people seem totally engaged in what they are about. They scarce lift their eyes. Now we know now there are spiritual consequences in this Aboriginal culture for communicating with the dead. They did not think that it was a good idea to talk to a ghost, so they were really staying out of their way. Cook writes in his diary that they catch three or four hauls of delicious fish. Uh, the local story is that the Western boat takes far more than it needs. Um, Cook's men are delighted because they find a lot of stingrays swimming in the shallow water so they catch those too and eat them now to the aboriginal people stingrays are a spirit ancestor so they would have been very very upset by this as well um, now joseph banks had gathered lots and lots of new plants at this place so james cook decided to call it botany bay uh, now the local people were a bit confused by this they don't know why Cook didn't just ask them what the name of the place was, because obviously they'd been living there for thousands of years, and it already had a name. It's called uh, Kame. But eventually the ship passed on again to a place called 
Uh, Beer Bay, forgive my pronunciation. The National Museum of Australia tells the story of someone from Beer Bay who was born in 1948 on the balcony of a hospital because Aboriginal people weren't allowed to have their children inside the wards. That's, that's just an aside. He keeps going. And on the 11th of June, 1770, the Endeavour is sailing through the Great Barrier Reef when disaster strikes. Just before midnight, it hits a reef and gets stuck and the ship begins filling with water. So imagine this, the ship is full of brand new charts and maps that they've just made, beautiful specimens on board, flowers and plants. And um, don't forget, they can't email copies out there or take any photos. Everything is about to sink into the water, never to reach England. Joseph Banks writes in his diary, Skets were we warm in our beds when we were called up with the alarming news. Cook orders his men to lighten the load of the ship by throwing things overboard. So they, they throw cannons overboard, um, they throw jars, glasses, but these six cast iron cannons, they are quite a loss. They just get dumped in the sea. Um, the exhausted crew spend 24 hours trying non-stop to keep the ship afloat. And yeah, very, very brave men. There's no doubt in that. Don't forget that they're about a year's travel from home as well. No telephones. Very brave men. Eventually, they stuff one of the sails into the hole of the ship. And that just about solves the problem. And the ship is repaired and gets home. Cook returns to England. And the east coast of Australia is drawn onto Australian maps of the globe for the first time ever. He is an absolute hero. As an aside, because it's interesting history, uh, 13 years after Cook gets home, Britain loses the War of Independence in America, uh, which was terrible for the British for lots of reasons. We'd been sending our convicts to America, and now we couldn't do that anymore because America's nothing to do with us. What are we going to do? Where are we going to send our convicts? Well, Joseph Banks, you remember the botanist who was on board the Endeavour, who is now the head of the Royal Society, he says, uh, oh, well, I know a great place. You should go to Botany Bay. We could send all our convicts there. It's got lovely weather. And there would be little opposition from the natives. Uh, now, in fact, when 1,500 Europeans arrive in Botany Bay with hardly any food and loads of foreign animals and guns, the locals are not happy. But this is the story of Captain Cook. And we will end the tale in Hawaii. If you've heard the song... The Ballad of Captain Cook by my fantastic friend Laurie Duckworth. You know that that is where Captain Cook ends his days. It's January 1778. Cook has explored the Arctic region. He's charted the New Hebrides. He's discovered New Caledonia and it's his first visit to the Hawaiian Islands. Cook and his crew are welcomed by the Hawaiians. They're excited to see him. It's, everything's very happy. Um, then the ships go north to do some more exploring and they come back about a year later. Now they arrive at the time of the festival of the god Lono into what is thought of as Lono's port. Now some, some stories say that the Hawaiians thought that Captain Cook was a god. Some historians say that that's, that's sort of treating the Hawaiians is quite stupid and that's not fair. We don't know. But anyway, things went quite wrong quite fast. Cook made definitely some mistakes. He took apart a religious building, a religious building, just to use the wood. And then he offered the chiefs, the Hawaiian chiefs, two axes in exchange. Now, they unsurprisingly refused the axes and a very cross. One of the captains that Cook is working with accuses the locals of stealing his boat. Uh, and then it, it, it just sort of crops up again and it turns out that it didn't get stolen after all. Um, so it's, it's just all a little bit awkward. Lots of things happen which mean that the relationship gets very strained. So the British leave Hawaii but rough seas damage the ship and oh awkwardness they've got to come back a week later. They're greeted by an angry mob. They get stones thrown at them um, and Cook tries to, to kidnap a chief because someone really has stolen a boat and Cook wants it back but he's an important chief and they end up all on the beach and there's angry Hawaiians. Eventually Captain Cook himself is killed by the mob. Now some men make it back to the ship, make repairs over the next few days while occasionally firing cannons at the Hawaiians on the shore. It's a pretty messy end for our famous explorer of the seas. Just before we finish, I'll tell you, those cannons that Cook dropped off the side 
when he hit the Great Barrier Reef. They were recovered by scientists. In 1969, they were so covered in coral that they were barely recognisable. That is the story of Captain Cook, tenuously related to the Great Barrier Reef because he discovered the Great Barrier Reef by whacking his boat into it. Harry says he didn't know that about Captain Cook. Harry, neither did I a week ago. Uh, I had to change it because I just thought he was some brilliant, famous explorer hero, and he kind of is, but obviously there's always two sides to a story. Uh, right folks, yes that is it from me, thank you so much for joining me. If you haven't already, please please like my Facebook page, follow me on Facebook, subscribe to me on YouTube. Um, I'm taking a week off next week to finish and like polish up and publish the magazine that I'm writing for my patrons and to send them loads of posts as well. Um, if you would like to support me monetarily then you can go on my Patreon page, there's a link on my pinned post and have a look at what that means. So, oh thanks Alice, you've reminded me that in order to try and save the coral they're basically sort of genetically modifying it. Like they're taking the strongest most resilient coral that is able to survive in warm water or slightly more acidic water and they're kind of breeding it and planting it out um, which sort of feels wrong doesn't it it feels like you shouldn't mess but I've seen a couple of interviews oh you're welcome Charlie H9 uh, I've seen a couple of interviews with scientists saying like, they didn't like the idea either and then it just got to the point where there's nothing else to be done right off yeah off I go off I go to uh, to get my own beautiful child